Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar today, which is uh, jointly put on by the Democracy Collaborative and Project Equity. My name is Allison Lingain. I'm co-founder of Project Equity. We're based in Oakland, California. We're focused on uh, scaling up worker co-ops, and we believe that conversions are a big part of the recipe to accomplish that scale. And so we're here today to share with you um, some learnings on worker co-ops. We've got about uh, we had over 100 people registered for the webinar. I think people will probably be trickling in as we get underway. Right now, there's about 40 people on, and um, folks from all um, sort of all of the, the types of participants you would expect. Folks from co-ops, folks from uh, we have some some funders, we have some folks from government, we have some co-op developers, and just a, a number of other interested folks. So um, thanks so much for joining. And with that, I will pass it on to Marjorie Kelly from the. Democracy Collaborative to kick us off. Um, one one quick comment, which is that we will we'll be have we will have time at the end for questions and discussion. And so, if you do have questions, go ahead and just enter them into the chat box on the webinar. And then at the end, when we open it up for questions, you'll be able to raise your hand if you want to actually do your question over audio. So go ahead, Marjorie, take it away. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you, Allison. Yeah, I uh, I want to say I'm thrilled to be here today. And uh, can you see my screen now? No, I can't see the screen yet. All right, so now are you seeing it? Yes. Now you're seeing it? Yes. Okay, great. Good. No, well, pardon? So now are my slides up? No, they are not. All right, now they should be. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone, as we as we uh, work through this. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a huge fan of Project Equity and and what they're doing. And I want to start us off by talking about, um, you know, why why are we talking about worker co-ops and the problem that we want to solve? As we know, income inequality is is a huge problem in our in our economy today. It's it's as high as it was. Uh, before the Great Depression, and um, um, hmm. I'm sorry, my slides are not advancing. There we go. And the racial wealth gap is, is a huge part of that too. The weight, the wealth of, of Black and Latino households is is a fraction of that of whites. And what my work over the years has shown me is that. Uh, that, that wealth inequality is not a side effect of our economic system, but a direct effect. And that the, the structure of the system is what controls its behavior. And you, when, when you look at an economy, um, ownership is the foundational aspect of, of structure. So we have now a system dominated by Wall Street ownership. Uh, the 1% own the majority of stock, and therefore the economy is about maximizing income and profits for uh, investors, for the 1%. <clears throat> there are other ways to organize an economy, other ways to design ownership, and, and doing this is a foundational part of our work of building a different kind of economy. <clears throat> so today we're talking about uh, one kind of worker ownership, and that is worker-owned cooperatives. Now these can be defined as businesses that are owned and controlled by their workers, and they're owned and controlled on a uh, basis of one share, one vote. Now this is not the only kind of worker ownership. We have uh, employee stock ownership plans. You can kind of see here on the right the big world of employee ownership. Uh, there's also other kinds of cooperatives, like credit unions or <clears throat> uh, consumer uh, co-ops like grocery stores. Worker-owned co-ops are a particular kind of co-op, a particular kind of worker ownership that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, worker ownership, this, this should be much more widely understood than it is, but it, it brings benefits for workers like higher pay, more assets, some voice and governance. It also it helps businesses with higher productivity and lower uh, employee turnover and businesses uh, live longer. And there's, uh, when bi businesses are owned by their employees, they're inherently locally owned. So there's a local spending 
multiplier and lots of, of benefits of worker ownership. Now, one of the things that we know <clears throat> is that if, if we're trying to get to a different kind of economy, we can't start all the businesses we need to get there. So converting existing businesses to worker ownership is a really critical part of what we're doing. There's lower risk if you're, you're converting, uh, converting a business and starting one up. And also, when you don't have succession planning for owners, that's the number one preventable cause of job loss. <clears throat> We're also coming into a period of baby boom retirement uh, where there's enormous opportunity for converting businesses. Um, <clears throat> baby boom founders, those are family businesses. Only 15% of those are going to succeed to the second generation. Only 5% of family businesses go on to the third generation. Often they're sold to out-of-state buyers or, or private equity firms. And what if we instead saw a major movement to convert existing businesses, particularly baby boom businesses, uh, to worker ownership. We see a huge, huge opportunity here. There's people have been talking about this, that trillions of dollars of business value are going to change hands in the next decade or two. And it's an opportunity to get some of that into the hands of employees. <clears throat> um, baby boomers, there, there's four million businesses, uh, two-thirds of them, uh, this is two-thirds of all businesses with employees, and most of them are, are not looking to uh, children for their succession plan. So we're going to talk today about co-op conversion, uh, this opportunity. So l let me just run through the agenda really briefly here. Um, we're going to see the learnings from a dozen case studies. We're going to hear from three different uh, um, employee-owned cooperatives, Namaste Solar, Island Employee Cooperative, Mariposa Gardening and Design. Uh, we'll talk some then about business readiness and, and move on to discussion. So you can enter your questions there on your panel. Um, and John uh, Duda at Democracy Collaborative will be gathering those as we go along. At the end, you can also uh, raise your hand. There's a particular button. John will walk you through that. And we can take some questions verbally. Let me just introduce our panelists uh, briefly. We're delighted here to have our first panelist will be uh, Blake Jones. He is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Namaste Solar. This is an employee-owned cooperative. It's a solar electric company based in Colorado. Uh, it's democratically managed. It's also a certified B corporation, which means benefit corporation. It has its charter to serve uh, public benefit. It has a pay cap of 6 to 1, and it donates 10% of after-tax profits to the community, which is <clears throat> really quite high. It's um, transparent. And uh, Blake is an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award recipient uh, recently, so congratulations to Blake for that. And he has a bachelor's in civil engineering. A second we'll be hearing from Rob Brown. He is uh, the director of uh, Cooperative Development Institute's uh, Business Ownership Solutions Program. And this is a program that promotes worker ownership in Maine, and it works with retiring business owners and their employees to help uh, convert these businesses to worker-owned cooperatives. He's also organized mobile home park residents uh, to convert their parks into resident-owned cooperatives. And that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that work, and I think Maine is a wonderful uh, statewide opportunity for some of this uh, for some of this work. And, and finally, there in the Bay Area, we'll be hearing from Andrea Hurd. She's with Mariposa Gardening and Design. She has some beautiful slides of the gardens that she and her uh, fellow co-workers have designed. This is a, a privately owned San Francisco area landscape design company, and they're in the process of converting to worker-owned cooperatives. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over and Allison. Okay, thank you so much, Marjorie. So we just heard from Marjorie why why worker co-ops and conversions matter, um, and I'm gonna gonna delve into some really some learnings and some takeaways from a dozen case studies. So let me step back a little bit. So Project Equity, probably about a year ago, we started asking this question of what really is the opportunity for conversions to play a key role in scaling worker co-ops as really a, a community economic development strategy. 
as a way to as a way to work against some of those really bad stats that Marjorie was uh, sharing about our our uh, wage and wealth inequality. And so we started off on sort of this mission of learning as much as we could about conversions, and, and we, we had this key question we set up for ourselves, which was we wanted to find out the success and the failure factors of worker co-op conversions. And so we talked to a bunch of different businesses that converted. We talked to a, a number of different um, sort of experts in supporting businesses through that conversion process, both on the worker co-op side and on the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan side. Um, and we just read as much as we could get our hands on. And so we ended up then with this really rich resource that was really super useful for ourselves that we decided to turn into a publication. And it's available on our website at www.project-equity.org. Um, and it has a, a dozen case studies. And so what I'm going to walk through for you are some of the really high-level takeaways um, from that research. And I'm going to start off with um, the kind of what we came across as the, the core motivators of, of why businesses choose to convert to worker ownership. And so, you know, the first is really, uh, Marjorie talked about the silver tsunami, the retiring baby boomers. So there's this exit strategy for the owner, right? The owner is looking to sell their business to somebody, uh, whether it's retirement or other reasons, and selling to their employees can be a, a really appealing option for many reasons. The second is, is a, as a component of the business's mission. So you know, businesses uh, often really pay close attention to how their operations are affecting all of their different stakeholder groups. And uh, worker co-op is great for really, I would say, maximizing or optimizing impact on stakeholder groups, especially the employees. Um, so for, for companies that, that care deeply about their impact in the world, this can be a really, a really nice alignment. And then the third real motivator here is is especially uh, true holds true for low wage sectors to create wealth building opportunities. So Marjorie was talking about the benefits of worker co-ops, you know, benefits to workers, um, you know, higher pay, wealth building opportunities. So if you're in a low wage sector where you're barely making in, making enough to make ends meet, if you were instead in a worker owned cooperative, you'd be in a very different place financially. And then this last reason, um, in our in our sort of travels around to learn all about this, we you know it, it didn't really come out as a key key initial motivator, but it really should be and could be in its own right. But it said employee owned employee owned businesses are just good business. They've demonstrated the ability to be more financially successful and to weather economic storms more effectively. So these are the core motivators. So let me talk um, a little bit about what we're calling a typology of worker co-ops. So these these uh, conversions that we studied really kind of fell into to four key groups. Um, all right, now I'm having trouble with my slides advancing. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay, so um, so there are kind of four four situations, if you will, um, that that kind of out of which come co-op conversions. So the so we just name them types one through four. So the first type is when um, the owner is selling to existing employees and has the intention to remain with the company. So we're going to hear from Blake Jones of Namaste Solar of the experience of, of his company, um, of their company really. Um, and so this is when the, the the owner or the owners. So when I use the word owner, really it's shorthand for owner or owners. But the owner, the owners are are selling because they believe and they're committed to employee ownership as a as a real alignment with with what they want for the future of their business. The second type is when an owner is selling to existing employees with the intention of leaving. Again, this is more of the retirement scenario, and we're going to hear from Rob about the Island Employee Cooperative. And then type three is when the owner decides to convert to a co-op and and realizes that they need to bring in new people to kind of be by their side as founding worker owners. And that's really the case of, of Mariposa Gardening and Design. Uh, we'll hear from them. And then the last one, type four, is when employees either leave an existing business, it's not a good fit for them for whatever reason, and start a, a new business that they form as a co-op together, or they will restart a failed business. And I'm saying failed in, in quotes. Um, as a worker co-op, because one of the key things about conversions is we want never want to sort of shackle the new owners, the the new worker owners, with a business that is is failing for market reasons. Uh, when we say a conversion of a failed business, we really mean it's failing because of something about the current structure, something about when the 
with something about the owner um, who may who's leaving the business or otherwise. Um, but worker co-ops, like any business, need to succeed on their own right um, in the marketplace. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and just give you a brief example from the case studies uh, that we pulled together of each one of these. And I'm going to talk about really, you know, as I mentioned, we're looking for success or failure factors. So I'm going to talk about key learnings or takeaways. And um, bef before I do that, I just want to briefly kind of summarize here, you know, from a tactical perspective. We've been talking from a strategic perspective. Why is, is our business conversions to worker co-ops good? But tactically, like, really, what is it? So, um, you know, in essence, you're, you're, it's a sales transaction from an existing business to a new entity that is a worker-owned cooperative. And so you need to set up that new business entity, create that new, that new worker co-op, and then you have to have a sales transaction. So I often will explain this to people similar to when a, a house is being sold, right? So you're selling the asset of the house from, a, from the seller to the buyer, and it needs to be financed. So in this case, you're selling the existing business or its assets from the, from the owner to the new worker co-op, and it can be financed by uh, debt financing, an outside lender like a bank or CDFI. The seller owner can finance it, um, uh, or there can be non-voting equity shares issued or some combination. And then the third and really critically important piece is it's also a transition of both roles and culture among the new worker owners to take on that ownership responsibility um, of the new worker co-op and to organize themselves structurally to run it under democratic governance. So those are that's tactically what a, what a business conversion is. So now I'm going to move into giving you some examples from these case studies about business conversions. So again, type one is this example where the owner sells to existing employees with the intention of remaining with the company. And uh, this, this case study is real pickles. They sell exactly what they say. They sell real pickles. <laughs> They're based in Massachusetts. Uh, we're found in 2001. And in 2012, the then co-owners and their employees came together and decided to convert into worker-owned co-op really for two reasons. One is to, is to preserve their social mission. Again, this is alignment of the, you know, really alignment of the worker co-op from a mission perspective. Uh, for the long term, and 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 as a as an employee retention strategy, right? You wanted to keep on the people who are really helping to make the business hum. And so, the <clears throat> calling out some of these key lessons or effective practices. So this is an example, as as really we recommend for any conversion, that you're converting an already successful business, right? We don't want to shackle shackle sort of the new employees, the new workers, owners with with a business that isn't successful. And in their case, they had a very broad customer base, well-established and broad customer base, a lot of loyalty to their business. And because of that, they were able to take advantage of an innovative community financing tool called a direct public offering. I won't go into the details of that now, but if you uh, aren't familiar with that and would like to know more, I recommend you look, at, look up Cutting Edge Capital. They're based in, in Oakland as well. Um, so a really innovative way to, to finance that sales transaction. And then they also really invested in an ongoing way in training for their workers. So not just at the time of conversion, but, but after and into the future. And they maintained throughout that conversion process a strong network of external support and advisors. So, you know, there's a, a slew of expertise, areas of expertise that you want to have um, supporting you through a, through a conversion. Obviously, legal, financing, uh, you know, CPA and accounting as well as advisors um, and, and experts in that co-op culture and, and developing that, that uh, across the organization. Okay, so that's real pickles, type one. <clears throat> so then moving on to type two, select machine. So this is when the owner is, is intending to leave, in this scenario, um, intending to retire. So it was founded uh, in 1994, based in Ohio, and they're, uh, they manufacture and distribute machine products and equipment. This was a situation where the kids didn't want the business, and uh, as they looked around for, to try and find prospective buyers, they were disheartened to find out that you know buyers were really only interested in dismantling the company and laying off the workers, and they primarily were just interested in the customer list. So they wanted they they turned to a co-op conversion as a way to to really help their company stay. Um, you know, stay healthy and profitable, keep have their employees stay their jobs, stay keep their jobs, and so they could retire. Um, you know, retire with peace of mind. And so this was a 2006 conversion. And some of the key lessons from Select Machine are that 
they were able to uh, get some grant funding actually to pay for a feasibility study around their conversion and to pay for a financial valuation. So um, back again to that uh, analogy of worker, I'm sorry, of, of selling a house. When you sell a house, the bank insists on having an appraisal done of the house to really make sure that the market value of, of that sales transaction is accurate. And so we recommend the same thing for uh, co-op con co conversions. It's a sales transaction. You want to make sure that the market value of that company is, is accurate, and that can be done by getting a third-party financial valuation. Another really uh, key, I would say, effective practice for them was they staged the purchase. They first sold 40%. And after that was, was paid back, they uh, followed on with the, the remaining 60%. And also, they really depended on some key outside advisors um, from within their state and especially from OEOC. <clears throat> then the select machine is a key example of how the owner can, in this case, the owners can play a really important role in supporting that su successful transition. So even though the owners are transitioning out, um, in the case of Select Machine, they remain on as worker owners for the first years because um, when an owner leaves, an owner will often leave a big gaping hole in terms of the operational role they play, the knowledge and experience, and the relationships both inside and outside of the company. And so they were able to really transition that effectively by staying on for a couple years. They also personally guaranteed the loans, which was huge and really helped to enable them to attract uh, bank financing. Um, among others, among other financing. And uh, the remember I talked about that, tr that stage transition, the 40% and the 60%. So when it came time for the 60%, um, it was during an economic downturn. And so the owners were able to be flexible with the timing of that stage of sale, which really helped the company. Okay, so that's the type two conversion. <clears throat> type three is a, a great uh, business, Simple Diaper and Linen. They're in Western Massachusetts, founded in 2009. And the owner really wanted to um, expand the business, wanted to grow the business, and wanted business partners, frankly. And uh, you know, she could have gone the route of a, of a partnership or some other way to bring in business partners, but decided that the cooperative ownership was a really great way to maintain her mission. So again, this was real mission alignment. <clears throat> Type three are more likely to take place with uh, small businesses, just given that you're bringing in new, new folks, new worker owners. So for them, key lessons were uh, that she took the time to find the right founding worker owners. And I know that Andrea from Maricos is going to talk a bit about that as well. And again, just tapping, tapping, um, you know, tapping a support network. So there's a strong cooperative network in New England. The Valley Alliance of Worker Co-ops and the Cooperative Fund of New England um, were really key for them. And then they, they, they joined the Valley Alliance of Worker Co-ops to be able to take, take advantage of, of the that network and all it has to offer. So then finally, the type four is New Era Windows. So this is a Windows manufacturing company in Chicago. It was founded in 2012 by a group of former employees who were union members. There was a bankrupt company. It's a little, little complex. You can read all about it, so I won't go into the details. But essentially, the entire factory workforce of 40 to 50, I can't remember exact numbers, but um, was laid off. And in part, because they had the uh, strong union organizing, they uh, they had that infrastructure already in place. They were able to organize to, to have a subset of those workers go off and kind of restart this failed business under a new name. In particular, there were three union members who really demonstrated strong leadership and were responsible for driving that conversion forward. You know, and the, the, these were the factory floor workers who came in and started this company. And so they knew how to make windows. They knew how to run the business. Um, but what they didn't have was that level of management. And so uh, the organization that was really instrumental in helping them, a nonprofit based in New York City called The Working World, um, they really played that incubator, um, hands-on role in terms of, of helping to, to fill that gap and, and uh, support the worker owners to, to develop into those roles. They also brought in financing, <coughs> excuse me, financing and played key advisor roles. So that's, that's an example of a type 4 conversion. So, um, these are just, just the list of businesses that are available for case studies, and the ones in uh, red are the ones who we're going to hear from today. So with that, let me turn it over to Blake from Namaste Solar. Okay, my slides up. 
Yes, you're up there. There we go. Okay, again, my name is Blake, and I'm here in Colorado. And just a f briefly about our company, we're a, a solar electric contractor. We design and install solar electric systems for homes, businesses, hospitals, schools. We're about 10 years old. Uh, last year, our revenue was around 25, 30 million. And we've got three office locations, uh, two here in, in Colorado, and we just opened an office in White Plains, New York, earlier this year. We started our company as an employee-owned company, and we it was our own custom model. Uh, we, I think, if at the time uh, we did not know about cooperatives, we didn't know we didn't know much at the time. We were all first first-time entrepreneurs, uh, but we created a custom employee-owned model, and that worked really well for our first six years. But in 2010, we we built some momentum, which I'll, I'll talk about, where our employee owners wanted to convert to a worker cooperative, and we did that. It was official on um, January 1st, 2011. Uh, right now, we're about uh, 105 employees. Um, we're, we're, we're growing this year, so we're actively hiring, but approximately half of us are co-owners. and uh, what we call candidates are people who want to be co-owners. They're on their path to becoming a co-owner, but you have to complete a one-year candidacy period. And in that candidacy period, you learn a lot about um, about the company, about financial literacy, about our culture, our history, things like that. So that's a little bit about us. Why did we convert to a cooperative? There are a lot of reasons. And I think it's also fair to say that different employee owners had different reasons for wanting to convert. But I think two of the, the top reasons uh, that we all that we all had in common was that I, a cooperative structure is in much better alignment with our original vision uh, and for the, what the company we wanted the company to be in our in our values. And when we started it, we knew we wanted it to be employee owned. And we, you know, in the early years when we were when we were smaller, we we managed a lot uh, at an operational level through consensus and, and democratic votes. Uh, but we always knew that if push came to shove and a, a stockholder vote were required, we had different employees with different levels of stock ownership. And if push came to shove, something could be taken to a stockholder vote. We actually had uh, um, a very interesting uh, situation, um, a business school wrote a case study on it where we almost sold the company back in 2008 before the economic downturn. Solar uh, was hot then, it's, it's still hot now. Our, our company was growing very, very quickly and we had a lot of acquisition offers that uh, proactively were, were put before us whereby our employee owners could have made a lot of money and it ended up that we decided not to sell. But if some of the stockholders would have wanted to. They could have said, "Hey, let's let's put this to a stockholder vote," and the the, the results you know may have been different than if done on a, on a one person one vote basis. But we we really wanted to have our capital structure and our governance structure match that original intention of, of being a democratic uh, company in terms of, of governance. So that was that was one of the top reasons. Another one was that it it made it easier for us to bring on external investors. It actually used to be one of almost one of our core values in the early years of the company that we were never going to have external investors. And as naive first-time entrepreneurs, uh, we just hadn't yet uh, we did, we weren't aware of, of of all the possibilities. And what we were really trying to say was we didn't want to share control with external stakeholders. We wanted employees, only the people who are on the ship, to be deciding which direction the ship was going to go in. And when we learned about the, the cooperative model, uh, in particular a, a role model of ours, uh, Equal Exchange, uh, and, and how they had done it, they created a, a class of non-voting preferred stock that they could sell to external investors as a way of getting a, a new source of capital, but not, um, not messing with or not hurting their their employee control structure, their cooperative structure. So those are two of the, the, the two top reasons why we converted. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through uh, what I put in six, six steps uh, of, of our conversion. And at the time, we weren't thinking, OK, this is our first step. This is our second step. I came up with these steps retroactively afterwards after reflecting on it. But it, it, it turned out that our, our process was, was pretty good. It took us about a year from the time that we conceived of the idea and first introduced it to other employee owners to when the 
ink was dry on all of the conversion documents, which again happened on, on January 1st, 2011, we created a task, a task force. It was a volunteer task force or a committee of a, a, any employee owners who were interested that really helped to drive the process and did a lot of the, the legwork and the research and interviewed different um, consultants who could help us uh, interview um, other cooperatives and, and gathered a lot of information. They really, the, the formation of that committee really helped the process. We also had monthly meetings and we had two company retreats where this was one of the main topics of discussion, but it allowed for uh, progress to be made, it allowed for incremental check-ins, allowed for people to have time to sleep on it, to digest, uh, for, for, for new ideas to come up and, and, and help uh, turn the process left and right all, all along the way, but that, uh, that one-year timeline ended up, ended up being very comfortable for us. Uh, the second step was we wanted to determine what, what is the structure, what's it going to look like on the other side? When we convert, what will it look like? And we, again, we, we, we modeled our capital structure after equal exchanges, uh, and we had two classes of stock. One was going to, we call it class A, it was a voting common stock. Uh, only employees could own that stock. Uh, one employee, one share, one vote basis. Uh, it would be fixed price. We came up with, with that price, $5,000, and there was a lot of healthy democratic debate about that. Should it be higher or lower? We wanted, the, we wanted there to be enough of a, of a, of a tangible sacrifice to, to, to buy stock, that, that there was skin in the game that each of the employee owners had. We wanted to share the, the full uh, small business ownership experience, and we thought that it required financial risk in order to do so, but we didn't want that stock price to be so high that it, it prevented folks um, from, from having that opportunity to be an owner, and we, and we do provide a loan uh, for folks to, to pay through paycheck deductions uh, for that $5,000 stock price. But that was, a, that was an important decision to make, was how much was that stock price going to be. And then we created what we called Class Z uh, preferred stock. It was non-voting, it doesn't have voting rights. Uh, it had an annual dividend target of 6.5%, not a guarantee, but a, but a target, and it too was fixed price. So it's very similar to subordinated debt, except that it's more friendly to the company because it's, because it's equity. And uh, if the company can't pay the full dividend target, for example, the, it's not like subordinated debt, in, in, in which case the loan would go into default. Um, we also set a expectation that, that that stock would be held by its owners for at least five years, and that redemption wouldn't be guaranteed, but that the company would be doing its best to provide redemption to the owners of that stock. The next step was for us to develop our bylaws, and we used uh, Equal exchanges bylaws was a very helpful example, and theirs in turn is based on uh, a, a set of model bylaws created by the ICA group, uh, and those were really helpful. We made our own edits and our own changes to it, um, but it was very helpful to have that template as a starting point, and coming up with that bylaws was an, was an important part of the process to say, hey, how are we going to govern ourselves when the conversion is complete? The next step was we, we, we needed to have a vote and we were essentially selling the company to ourselves. You know, it wasn't uh, one or two owners selling to 30. It was, and I think at the time we had around 50 uh, employee owners and we were selling to ourselves. But we had some people who did not want to convert, or I should say, it's not that they didn't, they didn't want to convert, but they didn't want to keep their capital in the company after the conversion. So we had to create the criteria for what's, what's going to be a passing vote. Um, is this something that we all want to do? And I think that even if you had a smaller number of owners, even if it were just two, uh, they would have to make that decision. What, what are the circumstances under which this is something we want to move forward with? So we decided that we needed to have more than 85% of our stock vote yes, because we had employees owning different levels of stock uh, at that time. Uh, a no vote would trigger a redemption, basically saying, uh, I, I want to get my money back. I don't want to keep it committed in, in, in the new cooperative form. And, and we decided that we couldn't afford more than $300,000 in no votes or $300,000 $300, in, in, in payouts. So we, we, this, was, this was the criteria for a passing vote that we came up with. The next uh, step was to have, you know, what, 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 what's the ballot actually going to look like? And we decided to, to, to actually have two votes. One was, are you willing to convert your stock into the new cooperative entity? Are you willing to, to commit your capital to staying in, the, in the, the cooperative entity for at least another five years? If you, if you voted no, you could get your money out. And I'll give some more details on that. It wasn't 
um, all in cash. Some of it was in cash. We could afford a certain amount, but uh, the remainder was in promissory notes that the company could pay out over time. And we had to agree upon a, uh, an interest rate and, and, and things like that that we all uh, thought was fair. The And actually, that referred to our original stockholder agreement, which was a in some ways that was already decided because it was in our original stockholder agreement. The second part of the vote was, do you want to immediately become a an owner, a co-owner of the cooperative, or do you want to become a candidate for one year and see how things go, uh, kind of uh, do a, do a test run on the on the new cooperative, if you will. And we had some people vote no on on the first vote and yes on the second vote. Uh, as an example, we had we had some people who said, I really love the conversion idea. I want to be a co-owner, but I can't afford to keep my money um, in, or I, whatever reason, I don't want to want to keep my recommit my capital to the company. The the next step was we had to figure out what our what we were going to value our company at, and this was an interesting one because again we were we were selling the the company to ourselves. We had the majority of people acting as both the seller and the and the buyer. And what we decided was we came up with we used. Uh, enterprise multiples um, 4.6 times our trailing 12 months EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's a common metric used when 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 valuing companies. But we we use that, which we thought was a very fair metric. Uh, we think it was lower than market. We we added some some discounts to it uh, because uh, like a liquidity discount or uh, another discount because none of the stock was going to be a majority owner. Um, but to make a long story short, we came up with a value that we felt comfortable with, both with our seller hat on and with our buyer hat on. And then we actually gave a uh, a carrot that if that the conversion strike price, if, if someone voted yes to recommit their capital to the company, we were going to give them extra, um, almost uh, around 10% more. Um, and that uh, so if somebody voted no and they wanted their capital out, they got the they got nine seven nine dollars and seventy five cents per share, and they got eleven dollars per share if they voted to to recommit their capital. So that what, what you would do was take somebody's uh, stock value, their strike value, and then we would convert that into a combination of Class A and Class Z stock. Um, so as an example, uh, if someone's stock, uh, if they decided to convert. Uh, someone's stock times $11 a share ended up being more than $5,000. They would get one class of a uh, one vote, one share of of Class A stock, and then they would get the remaining balance in Class Z shares. If they owned less than $5,000, if that's what their their um, the number of shares times $11 equaled, then they needed to cover the difference in order to to be able to come up with the full $5,000 and afford uh, one share of of Class A stock. So the results of this was we had 50 out of 52 uh, of us voted to become co-owners. We actually had one or two out of those 50 who uh, later decided to, to become a candidate because uh, they weren't able to come up with the full $5,000 and they, 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 they wanted to wait a little bit longer. 89% of the stock voted to convert and the other 11% voted to, re to redeem and that was in a combination of of cash and a four-year promissory note. I think the interest rate was pegged at, at prime at reset once per year, according to prime. Uh, and again, that was in our original stockholder agreement for the original uh, stock that we had before we converted. Uh, and then it turned out that we had, so we had 50 co-owners each with one share of, of, of stock and then 26 um, had uh, surplus, uh, you know, above the $5,000 value that got converted into the um, into Class Z holdings. So the interesting thing is that uh, four years later, we it was already in our bylaws that we created another another class called Class B, uh, non-voting preferred stock, and that is what we sold to external investors. We had a very successful private offering uh, three years ago, in which we brought on. Uh, around 25 external investors. Uh, since then, we've had two more and raised about $750,000. It sounds like real pickles in their conversion. They just combined these two steps. Uh, so they, they raised some money at the time of their conversion, whereas we decided, let's do the conversion, let the dust settle. And then after we've handled the conversion, we can have a private offering with much higher level of confidence. And our Class Z stock 
actually after the end of five years, it becomes class B. So our class Z and our class B were intended to merge and there's intended to be a sunset period for that class Z, which was only created for the purpose of the conversion. So all the class Z stockholders will become class B stockholders. And we're planning on having another private offering later this year where we're planning to raise more like two to $4 million. Some of that money may be used to provide liquidity to the original class Z investors. That's our intention because some of the employee owners have moved on uh, since then and we'd like to be able to redeem them at least in part if not in whole. And then it should be noted a lot of people ask, well, you have fixed price stock, but your company's been growing and you're continuing to grow. Um, does your stock value go up? No, it does not. We, we were very intentional about having all of our stock be fixed price stock. Uh, we don't plan on selling the company. If we did, there's a way that some of the, the proceeds get divided up amongst uh, class A, class B stockholders. And I think a third of it goes to, goes to the community. Um, but uh, it's intended to all be fixed price stock. So when someone wants someone, someone leaves the company or they want to sell their stock, they basically get their money back. These are intended to be income generating investments. And one uh, litmus test, you know, we have a lot of um, financially savvy investors and a lot of investors who are represented by investment advisors. Uh, they always closely scrutinize our, our financials and do their, their due diligence. But uh, what's easy, what makes our private offerings easier is that our, our book value on our balance sheet, it, it far exceeds the total stock value. So it's just a, an easy litmus test as to saying, hey, is this stock fairly priced relative to the, the company's value? And that's, that's one perspective out of, it, out of many, but it's an important one. And uh, that was it for the prepared slides. I don't know if we'll be doing questions later or or not, but I can hand over control back to you. So we are going to be doing yeah questions at question. We'll take questions at the end. So yeah, we'll take questions at the end of all of the presentations. Thank you so much, Blake. So we should pass it on now to Rob. And Rob, you'll need to unmute yourself. How's that? That's great. And doo -doo -doo. can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So, okay. Uh, well, thank you uh, for putting this together. This is uh, nice to see hear all these uh, good thoughts. Um, a little about uh, CDI to start with. Uh, we are the USDA designated Northeast Cooperative Development Center. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit group. We work uh, across all cooperative development sectors uh, and industries uh, uh, in New England and uh, some in New York. Uh, and really run the gamut of technical assistance, training, education, strategic planning, uh, board development, uh, uh, business planning, so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the program we're talking about today is uh, something that I created with my colleagues uh, to pilot here in Maine, a program called Business Ownership Solutions. Um, BOSS promotes worker ownership in Maine and works with retiring business owners and their employees to facilitate conversion to worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, there are some particular reasons why this made uh, so much sense to try and figure out this model in Maine. Uh, some of it's just personal. Uh, I'm born and brought up here and live here and care a lot about this state and where it's going. Uh, but more objectively, uh, Maine, 97% uh, of sm uh, businesses in Maine are considered small businesses. It's one of the, uh, I believe it's the highest concentration of any state in the country. Uh, of the 32,000 or so uh, small businesses with employees, uh, about 40% have less than 20 employees. So they have one to 20 employees. And about three quarters of businesses in Maine have less than uh, 100 employees. So uh, we're really talking about a state of very small businesses. And those businesses, uh, of those businesses, about three quarters of the business owners uh, are baby boomers. So uh, a lot of the data referenced by uh, Marjorie at the outset uh, all, certainly all holds true in Maine uh, to a much greater extent. Uh, we have the oldest workforce in the country, the oldest population uh, in the country, 
and so all of this is even more acute here. Uh, so for a lot of these folks, uh, selling to employees could often be the best option uh, if they know about it and understand how it could work. And, and sometimes, perhaps more often than sometimes, it could be the only option. Certainly the, the buyer pool for uh, small businesses throughout rural Maine is, is very thin at best. So talking about the IEC, I uh, put the slide together just as uh, to drive home the point of two of the great challenges to this particular deal. Uh, one is geographic, one is cultural. Uh, that's a map of Maine. If you go about four hours up the coast, if you cross the border from New Hampshire, you would get to uh, a, a, a peninsula that you would turn and drive down, and you would go over uh, these the, one of the oldest suspension bridges uh, in the country that is uh, uh, half a mile long. Uh, it really shows its wear and scares a lot of people. Then you go across another mile-long causeway uh, that uh, frequently uh, box trucks and tractor trailers get blown right off of because of the crosswinds and you are out on uh, a place called Deer Isle uh, and the town of Stonington which is the lobster capital of the world. Uh, more lobsters uh, come out of Stonington, Maine than any other port uh, in the world and so the economy there is very remote uh, and it is highly concentrated in uh, fishing generally and lobstering uh, specifically. Uh, the Stonington Lobster Co-op has been around since 1948, uh, so I'll reference the significance of that a little later. Uh, but uh, it is a beautiful place, but it is incredibly remote uh, and the, the community itself is uh, 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 extremely insular and so that raised some challenges again we'll get into that and so these are the stores the island employee cooperative uh, is made up of a, a decent sized grocery sto uh, store called Burn Cove Market uh, a medium sized grocery store called the Galley uh, and then a uh, uh, another store VNS Variety and Hardware uh, which also has a pharmacy um, so kind of the typical small town uh, image of uh, businesses uh, bootstrapping it. Uh, the conversion partners in doing this uh, were uh, ourselves, uh, Cooperative Development Institute. There was uh, another cooperative, uh, the Independent Retailer Shared Services Cooperative, uh, which is, as the name implies, it's a shared services cooperative made up of uh, 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 gro small grocers and some other retailers from Maine and a few from New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Uh, the, they, the IRSSC is a group that we also helped start and provided a lot of assistance to in, in their structuring and getting them going. Um, an accounting firm that specializes in retail called Specialized Accounting, uh, the funders uh, CEI uh, and Cooperative Fund of New England and now uh, uh, NCB, National Cooperative Bank, uh, were the funders. Um, so the, um, the interesting challenge of this conversion uh, really had to do with uh, the position of the, the retiring owners, the former owners. Uh, they waited until uh, really the very end uh, to, to come up, to, to, to focus on this idea. They had engaged a business broker uh, and had quietly, uh, confidentially tried to market uh, the businesses. Uh, they were a member of uh, the IRSSC um, as independent retailers. They had joined the IRSSC and it was through uh, the executive director of that shared services cooperative who had the established relationship with the selling owners that he said if you thought about maybe uh, a cooperative or some sort of uh, employee buyout uh, I know the people you could talk to if you're interested in understanding more of that and that is when I was brought up uh, to Stonington to sit down with those folks in their living room and spend two to three hours explaining to them what a worker cooperative is, what it isn't, uh, perhaps more importantly what it isn't uh, and how you know how a deal might work, might come together both in terms of the, uh, the, the transaction structure, the financing, uh, 
while making very clear that this is all speculative and how it could come together, uh, and we would have to start going down the path to see you know, if that all uh, plays out as predicted. So they, they agreed that they were interested in that. I, I think, again, to stress the cultural issues here, uh, the former owner was a very vocal, conservative uh, person. Uh, <clears throat> approaching him where he was, not where I wanted him to be or thought he might be, was critically important. Uh, and uh, making sure I talked about what could happen to these businesses as businesses uh, and talked his language to him uh, gave him a comfort level to allow me to sit down with his employees uh, and present this idea and have roughly the same conversation with him, uh, with his, uh, some of his employees that I had had with he and his wife. Uh, so that, fast forward from there, uh, he pulled together uh, about a dozen or so of his key employees for me to come and sit down with and, and again, have roughly the same conversation, do a little bit of a worker co-op one-on-one with them, go through all the same things, make clear to them that I have no idea how this might turn out or, or what bumps in the road will hit, but some ideas about how I think it could turn out. Uh, and and talk to them a bit about uh, the reference points that they did have uh, about what a co-op is. Um, like I said, the Stonington Lobster Co-op, there probably isn't a single uh, owner or employee of these businesses that doesn't have a family member uh, who is a lobsterman and probably a member of the Stonington Lobster Co-op. So there was a, a deep understanding of how that co-op worked as a producer cooperative. Uh, the store is a member of Associated Grocers of New England. Uh, which is an independent uh, purchasing cooperative. Uh, they're a, a grocery retailer, wholesaler, I'm sorry, grocery wholesaler. Uh, the Blue Hill Co-op is a sort of a traditional consumer food co-op, whole food uh, kind of co-op. Uh, less familiarity with that uh, because it was just uh, a different uh, a, a cultural and clientele uh, group, but they knew about it and they understood what it was, and they also knew what the independent retailer shared, shared services cooperative was. So they had that general idea of a cooperative. It's not like I needed to explain from scratch at a high conceptual level uh, what a cooperative structure is, uh, what it could do. Also, I would stress one of the more uh, 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 the better examples I could use with them is just New England style town governance. Uh, you know. Members of a community get together and vote on the budget line item by line item once a year. We elect a selectman's board uh, that does essentially what a, a, a board in a co-op would do. They hire a town manager that carries out the budget, uh, and that town manager reports back to the board, and the uh, eventually uh, the members of the town have that say. So it's a very direct style of governance, um, and frankly, that was probably the most uh, enlightening example that I could give them because people really understand that and participate in town governance uh, here. Um, so that's some of the uh, starting understanding. Um, <clears throat> some of the uh, challenges that we've faced, so I did a census of all the workers in the firm. Uh, the average tenure of all the employees was about 23 or 24 years. Uh, Again, pointing to the fact that these were decent jobs, uh, but they, it's also a very rural, remote community, and the employment prospects were very limited. Uh, so it, in many instances, it was the only job these folks had access to. Uh, so they were very good at what they did, uh, and they had great experience in, in the specific job that they did, but they had very limited entrepreneurial experience generally, and they certainly didn't have the experience that the, the, the former owner had in how all the pieces of the puzzle uh, fit together across the enterprise. Uh, there was a very strong existing, what I call a boss culture. Uh, the former owner uh, was a great guy, uh, but he was, uh, he, <laughs> he had some typical, uh, 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 employer uh, attitudes towards his employees. There was no uh, system of evaluation or accountability. There was no, it was all very arbitrary who he liked, who he didn't like, how he handled individual issues. Uh, it was more a matter of sort of screaming at people when they did something wrong as opposed to helping them be better at their job. So that was the culture that they were used to. 
Um, and that is obviously uh, radically different from the culture you need in a cooperative enterprise. Um, and certainly the complexity and the variety of the businesses involved, uh, uh, you know, dealing with a pharmacy in and of itself, uh, I can now tell you from experience, is uh, a crazy thing. The regulations uh, and the issues there, uh, you're also dealing in the grocery business uh, with a high volume, low margin, perishable uh, product uh, business. And uh, there is limited opportunity to, to, to mess up. Um, we also were dealing with a very short timeline. Uh, the owner wanted out. He wanted to go play golf in Florida. Uh, and so he, um, he really pushed hard uh, to the point that it, it made things difficult at times and, and probably made things more tense than they needed to be. Uh, but that's what he wanted, and we tried to honor that and move as quickly as we could, uh, knowing that many of these things were outside of our control, uh, particularly anything to do with financing. Uh, you're dealing with lenders at that point. Uh, and uh, an obvious challenge, there's no upfront employee equity. Uh, these folks did not have nest eggs that they could pool together uh, to go to lenders with, so there was uh, essentially zero equity. Uh, and there were really no models to look to in how to do this, uh, a, a, a conversion from uh, um, a, a single owner to a large uh, worker cooperative with multiple stores. Uh, the owner wanted out 100%, they wanted 100% conversion, he wanted out as quickly as possible, uh, and, <clears throat> and uh, 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 so really they were taking 100% ownership uh, overnight with, uh, uh, without an owner who's going to stay on. Uh, to ease the transition. Um, so there was no real model to look at uh, in how to do that. Um, so some innovations that I think uh, we hit upon in trying to uh, figure this out. Uh, one of the issues with the lenders, obviously, I mean, there was no equity. So all the traditional notions of loan-to-value lending, uh, you know, who's going to be in charge, what's the business plan, all that was kind of out the window. Um, which really actually put the uh, the onus on creating an incredibly detailed, uh, you know, bulletproof business plan um, that made the lenders comfortable with how these businesses were going to be run, what the chain of command was, who was going to make decisions, and uh, and and on this issue, uh, what what equity would come from the employees eventually, and. I would say this is one of the innovations. Uh, they came to the closing table, so to speak, uh, with no equity, but the uh, uh, employees uh, who wanted to join in uh, bought uh, uh, shares, and we had a two-share structure. So the founders' shares, uh, that I think this is what incentivized upwards of 80% of the employees to buy in. Uh, the deal was you get one Class A share, your, your traditional worker owner share, uh, for $1,000, uh, you'd be required to buy six $1,000 Class B shares. Those are, that's non-voting equity. Uh, and with a number of employees did that, within about four to five years, there would be about 300, a little over $300,000 in equity put into uh, the business. And the lenders uh, viewed that as, as a, a real commitment, real skin in the game, even though they weren't actually coming to the closing table with that money. So the and and the deal there uh, and the incentive there was that these are the founders' shares to reward them for the risk they were taking and the effort they were putting in and sort of the great leap of faith they were taking uh, and the fact that future members uh, would have to wait for one year uh, uh, and pay seven thousand dollars for one Class A share and there will be no Class B shares available to them. Uh, those Class B shares, by the way, uh, will pay an annual six percent dividend. Uh, some other innovations, uh, the commitment to buy the Class A and that Class B shares over time, considered as equity, as I referenced. Uh, another innovation, I think, uh, is the idea that the lenders required uh, substantial technical assistance contracts into the future as what I call a loan insurance on their part. They, want, they view us as uh, kind of their eyes and ears. Uh, there is myself, uh, another uh, uh, the manager of the, the, or the director of the uh, Independent Retailer Shared Services Cooperative also has a technical assistance contract, 
and a, an accountant, uh, an independent accountant from specialized accounting. Uh, the three of us together each have a separate contract with them and the lenders wanted to see those contracts and make sure that at the end of the day uh, we were uh, uh, helping them make good decisions, run those businesses effectively and could report back uh, to the lenders uh, well in advance of any problems that may occur. Uh, the use of, and if anybody on this call knows different, but as far as I know with lots of inquiry, this the 1042 rollover, uh, the IRS provision allowing a deferral of capital gains taxes was used in this transaction and I think it's only been done once, twice, three times, something like that with a worker cooperative uh, since it was implemented about 30 years ago. Uh, we were able to structure the transaction such a way that the seller uh, was able to realize uh, a substantially greater net net uh, profit off this deal by deferring capital gains taxes uh, because he sold it to his employees. Um, we were also able to use that to negotiate the selling price down about a quarter million dollars. Uh, so that benefited both uh, as the original uh, uh, provision was intended. Um, we also immediately started looking to existing uh, state programs that might uh, that support businesses uh, and uh, there is what is called the Maine Quality Center which is uh, uh, it's federal money that comes into the state of Maine so every state has access to this. It's used in different ways in different states uh, but in Maine it provides uh, uh, on-site uh, uh, customized training uh, to employees. It's frequently used you know if a company buys a new piece of equipment they write uh, a, a grant saying I need five people who know how to run this piece of equipment. Program is designed, they come do it. This was radically different and the community college system was very excited by how unique this was. And they were coming in and teaching a large group of employees about business ownership, on-site, uh, customer service, uh, management training. It was a very comprehensive training. It was a, a very large grant for the program. Uh, so we made use of that uh, to provide a, a lot of uh, customized training uh, from a third party, uh, which was very helpful. Oop. What just happened? There we go. Uh, so this is some board members uh, and the local volunteer fire department. Uh, everything is a volunteer in a small community like this, the fire department, the ambulance squads, uh, and so forth. So uh, they have uh, really taken the idea that part of their mission is to support the community to heart. Uh, they do a lot of fundraisers and matching fundraisers and raffles and so forth uh, to raise money for the volunteer fire department, for the for the EMT uh, squad, uh, for uh, the food pantry, for a variety of uh, community-based uh, 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 toys for kids at Christmas time and turkeys and Thanksgiving dinners at Thanksgiving time. They've done a lot of that right in their first year uh, with the real belief that they're one of their core purposes of existence is to support the community. Uh, more to the point, they believe uh, and over time will hopefully get better at believing and implementing. You know, their mission is to create good jobs and build wealth for the owners through ownership. Uh, and so that's what they're trying to do uh, now. Um, I'll stop there for one second. Uh, so the uh, there was a uh, uh, some additional issues about uh, that I just wanted to raise about some success strategies and some some difficulties. Uh, I think anytime you're doing something like this that's this complex, uh, making sure you have time built in uh, to take account of, of things that go wrong or, or don't go as planned uh, is important. Um, we all, everyone overestimated uh, in, including the lenders overestimated uh, how quickly this could probably be done. Uh, the, the lenders who were engaged at the outset, uh, CFNE and CEI, uh, really tried to sell this deal to over a dozen different lenders from around the country and nobody wanted to touch it. Uh, it also required more than what the, uh, the, the selling owner uh, has a substantial junior debt uh, note and uh, in the end, uh, towards the last minute, uh, it required him to, to double down on that amount uh, to bring in 
uh, the, the final piece of the financing package. So financing is, is really difficult, uh, but you're not going to do it without the financing, so you've got to figure out how to do that. Uh, one of the great challenges, I think, is that what we were trying to do really was get the deal done. And uh, with retail, they're open all the time. They're open seven days a week. They're open from 6 a.m. to 9 at night. So the ability to do any training in advance to try and uh, build this ownership culture uh, was extremely limited. Uh, I did a lot of work with the board. They really put their heart and soul into it, uh, and they put untold hours over the course of a year outside of their day jobs uh, to get this right, to spend hours and hours and hours studying equal exchanges bylaws and the ICA model bylaws and, and lots of other bylaws and understanding what they were creating. Um, but to move beyond the board into trying to do the training with a broad uh, membership base was almost impossible because uh, we were also trying to get this transaction done. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, we got that done. And we uh, uh, now we have to go back and over time, slowly but surely, uh, build that ownership culture one step at a time. Rob, I wanted um, to just jump in. Um, we have a uh, uh, we're about, have about 23 minutes left, so I wanted oh, to okay. if we could get some time to Andrea to tell her story and then have some time for questions and maybe if there's other stuff you want to talk about, we can get back to that at the end. Sure, I'll skip these last slides. That's fine. Cool. Okay, I'm turning it over to uh, Andrea over there. And you'll need to unmute yourself, Allison and Andrea. So. <clears throat> All right, so uh, Mariposa Gardening and Design, uh, we are still in the process of transitioning to worker ownership. Uh, I don't know how to make it come up. Oh, that one? Mm -hmm. Great. So what we do and what we try to focus on is building beautiful gardens for people. So this is an example of a lawn that we converted into a nice habitat garden. Um, we do a lot of innovative ecological design. I studied permaculture in 1991 and have been practicing those techniques ever since in terms of building habitat for wildlife, keeping our gardens uh, drought tolerant, and also keeping them beautiful is kind of our focus. Um, a garden should make you feel you've entered a privileged space, not a place just set apart but reverberant. And it seems to me that to achieve this, the gardener must put some kind of twist on the existing landscape, turn its prose into something nearer to poetry. Um, so that is something that we try to focus on at Mariposa Gardening and Design, function and form, and getting people sort of connected to nature in their backyards. Um, so I've been a business owner for the last 10 years. It's been a sole proprietorship, and my intention is to transition the business to worker-owned. Why? Um, we need to grow. The industry is growing, and the business needs to grow in order to support my family. Um, I am a single mother. I have multiple obligations outside of work, and I, I alone can't manage the growth of the business. Um, I also have this goal to promote permaculture horticultural principles to more conventional landscaping community and to demonstrate how they can be practiced by a larger contract landscape contracting company. So we're working towards that $1 million uh, mark, which is kind of the golden mark in terms of uh, a contracting company being you know, big and taken seriously in the industry as a big company. Um, also want to create a more socially equitable business, which is more in line with basic permaculture principles and a conventional business structure so that um, all of the employees have access to the capital of the business, not just the owner, one owner, which is the more conventional structure for a landscaping company. Um, and also we want to be more competitive with the larger contracting companies as an ecologically and socially responsible business and sort of try to stand out as leaders in the industry, in an industry where it's very easy for um, environmental practices to go by the wayside as well as practices uh, in exploiting employees. 
Um, the primary challenges have been for me with this desire to transition the business to a worker-owned cooperative for many years is finding worker owners willing to do the work to create the transition. Um, and really what I had to do is figure out how to hire people as worker owners rather than just hiring employees and trying to incite them into this idea of worker ownership. Um, over the years, access to legal and mentoring help um, as a sole proprietor and somebody who's very busy just trying to build up the business and keep it going, it's very difficult to figure out even what the process is to uh, convert the business. Um, and then just time to run both of it, like has been touched on before, to run the business and develop the cooperative, um, which you have to get all the daily work done, all the bookkeeping done, and then go through and determine all of the ways that you're going to transition and govern a new whole business. Um, so we were very fortunate last fall to become part of the Worker Co-op Academy and this was a, a, a workshop that was put on by a number of entities in the Bay Area, legal entities as well as mentoring entities who could help give us the education and information we need about worker ownership. So everything changed when we became part of the Worker Co-op Academy. Um, I have been interested in the Worker Co-op model for a number of years and I need to learn that lots of the laws had changed. And um, being part of the academy taught me what a good cooperative can be and what that means to become a cooperative. So we were able to read many presentations by um, other co-op members from local businesses around the community and we happen to live in a very co-op rich area, um, as well as lawyers, lenders, and other people in the community who are interested in supporting um, cooperatives and can help us figure out how to structure one successfully. Um, so in step one, finding the founder owners. What does it take to become a founder owner? I really had to find employees who are ready to take on more responsibility than your average employee who are um, interested and eager to take on responsibility of a business. Um, we've all been working of, at pay, working for less pay so that we can invest in our business in that way and um, keep our overhead low while we're making this transition. Um, and you have to say that up front and get people who are willing to do that, put in sort of like uh, sweat equity, I guess. Um, desire to be part of a growing business. Um, that's a completely different thing than plugging into just a job. You know, somebody who wants to actually have some sort of an entrepreneurial uh, spirit that they're putting into the work that they do every day. Um, a belief in the mission of the business, which is to promote ecological gardens um, and drought tolerant gardens and also we do a lot of stonework, which you can see in that picture. Um, knowing what it takes to become a founder owner helped me to direct my search people who fit the description. Before the Worker Co-op Academy, I did not understand that difference. So for me, that was a huge, huge part of my learning and the change um, that we've been going through. Um, step two, ongoing mentoring and legal support. Um, so the Co-op Academy ended in 2014, and in January we've been fortunate to have additional mentoring and legal support from the Worker Co-op cohort members from the East Bay Community Law Center and Project Equity to assist with the transition. Um, so both of the organizations are working with other cooperatives in the Bay Area, and so we have been meeting with them twice per month, with an, and I was able to bring on two new founder owners as employees. Um, of the business, uh, and so the three of us have been working with the ongoing mentoring, uh, mentoring and legal support since January. Um, they've been helping us develop our bylaws, and so by giving us a series of questions and templates that we can then on our own discuss and then come back with our mentors and provide the answers to the, the things that we need to figure out in order to figure out our governance structure. Um, the support that's been provided us to us by our team is uh, given all the founder owners the confidence that the transition to work owned is very doable. Without it, we wouldn't be able to make it happen. And what I mean by that is having that structure and that guidance has been crucial for us to be able to have the confidence because they have so much confidence in us that this is actually happening <laughs> and that we can keep and that we know what we always know what our next steps are. Um, so we've been doing on working on weekly meetings. So the three of us, the me and the other two founder owners, meet every Wednesday evening after work. Um, we've been discussing the things that we need to figure out for our bylaws, our personnel pro policies. Um, we've had to determine what a candidacy process is going to be for the new worker owners that are going to that we're going to try to recruit and come on after us. Um, we've been gathering our paperwork, our taxes, files, contracts, everything that we need to have ready to for documenting the business and the sale 
the transaction. Um, a big thing for us has been assigning board roles and responsibilities to the new founder owners. So the three of us consist of the board. We each have, we're working on cons consensus right now. Um, and we have one board member as the CFO, so he's dealing with the financial responsibilities and the day-to-day -day financial operations with the bookkeeper in the business. Um, we have the president, and he is dealing with structuring and organizing all the meetings that we need to be doing now that we're reorganizing the business in our new governance structure, so weekly meetings, monthly meetings, twice-a-year retreats. Um, and then I'm working as a secretary and just keeping notes of everything, which for me as uh, the owner, the uh, sole proprietor, is a huge relief. It's been really great. Um, and then opening the new bank account. Um, um, the cultural shifts at Mariposa Gardening and Design have really been um, a lot about encouraging new ideas, how to make the business work, rather than deciding them on my own, empowering others to make decisions. And so as a sole proprietor for so many years, I, I dominate that area a lot. And so it's, you know, for me to learn how to restructure our conversations when we're doing anything, whether it's in the field or in our decision-making process for the um, new entity, you know, how do others step in and, and make the decisions rather than just looking to me. Um, so that's been that's been a big learning and cultural shift that we're still in transition with. Um, adjusting to the amount of training necessary for myself and the other founder owners, just in what um, co-ownership is about a new uh, worker-owned cooperative. How does all of the things that we need to learn about that have been uh, a big, 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 huge learning curve for us all. Um, redistribution of responsibilities in the field based on the new founder owners' interests and capacity. Um, dividing the administrative and business management roles through the board in order to share the responsibility of running the business side with everyone more evenly. Um, and the weekly meetings to discuss our changing roles and our changing business has also kind of brought the three of us closer together in a different way outside of the work arena. Um, being in the field and build, building gardens and really thinking about the business and what our futures are together as business owners has really actually allowed that shift of responsibility to, to, to happen really naturally. Um, we could not have accomplished this without the efforts of all those involved in the Worker Co-op Academy, uh, CG3, East Bay Community Law Center, and Project Equity. Their ongoing education, mentoring, and assistance has made the difference from worker ownership being a dream to becoming a reality. Um, uh, the final stages, the founder owners as well as the mentoring team we've been working with are excited to complete the transition. Our goal to start date for the newly formed cooperative is May 31st, so that's coming up and we're excited. Um, we're excited about our growth potential and um, to share our learning about transitioning our business with other like-minded businesses. We found that um, a lot of people don't understand the benefits of worker ownership and converting a business into becoming a worker-owned cooperative uh, provides so many benefits just for the employees as well as for an owner like me that's been a sole proprietor for so long. And um, I'm eager to let other people know about how great that can be for them. That's great. Thank you, Andrea. So um, I am going to just quickly, this is Allison now, I'm just going to quickly bring up um, a brief slide. I'm only going to take a minute or so on this so we can have some time for some questions. Um, if you remember back, I was talking about us looking for success and failure factors. And as you can hear from these conversion stories and, and, and if you read the, the additional case studies, uh, that we have available, um, they really, they, we, we thought that they ended up being more readiness factors. So we hope that businesses can use this list and, and co-op developers can use this list as kind of a checklist of, okay, how ready am I? You know, there's some core things that are prerequisites, but there are many other things that can either be developed along the way or are just very helpful. They're not necessarily requirements, but are very helpful. Um, I'll let you read this. Uh, we can, you know, dig into this more in, in the question time period, but I don't want to take up our valuable last few minutes um, by going through this with you. So with that, let me thank all of the presenters um, and would really like to open it up to questions from, from folks who've been so patient in, in listening to us. And I'll turn it over to, to John to facilitate that. Okay. Hi, everybody. So we have a couple of questions that came in via the question feature on GoToWebinar. 
Um, so I'm going to start with those. But if you would like to also ask a question, feel free to either uh, you know type that into the text box or raise your hand um, on the webinar software, and I can just unmute you and let you ask your question directly. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from Matt Krop, and it's a question a little technical about uh, stock offerings and about preferred stock offerings, the things that Blake was talking about. Um, so the question is, for preferred stock offerings, what are the interest rate caps at the federal level? In Vermont, we have a state cap on return on capital at 6%. Uh, and I'm going to unmute everybody in case any of our panelists has a good answer for that or a good place to look to find that information. Rob, I, I would imagine you would uh, could speak to that. Uh, I can. Um, it, <clears throat> we had to do a private letter ruling through the uh, IRS, I'm sorry, the Securities Exchange Commission just to get out from under them. Because of the size of the transaction, it was over uh, the there's a limit to the number of shareholders uh, that, that you're exempt from SEC filing. So we had to get out from under that, and we did because it's a Maine corporation. The seller was from Maine. The buyers were all from Maine. Uh, so they said if Maine securities regulator is fine. We did a lot of work with the Maine securities regulator. What we had to do is uh, to get out from under their regulation was to change our original idea of the general Class B share offering uh, to make it only available to the workers. That's how we were able to do that. Um, if we were to do it otherwise uh, and try and make it a, a public offering, we would have to register those securities uh, with the state securities regulators. So I, I'm happy to talk more about that with anyone, but that's our experience, and our experience was all about how to get out from under the regulation. Good. So John, was that question? Did the question also ask? Is there simply about what is the percent of uh, capital gains? That's correct. I, I believe it's thirty-five percent, something like that. Am, am I right about that? So you know, in essence, if you can get out from under thirty-five percent in taxes, you can uh, you can sell the business for less and still make as much money. Am I right, Rob? Is that about the right figure? I'm sorry, I thought the question was about, from Matt Crop about, uh, did I miss something? I thought the question was from Matt Crop about uh, private offerings, uh, or public offerings of stock. It was for preferred stock offerings and for an interest rate cap. There's actually an extra interest rate cap. Okay. Somebody, uh, this is, this oh. is Blake. With, a, with preferred stock, there is no interest rate. Uh, interest rate is, a, in my understanding, is that that's for debt. When you have preferred stock, you one of the things that makes it equity is that you can't have a guarantee of of a payment on it. It's a it's a dividend, and that dividend has to be at risk in order for it to be truly counted as equity. So, well, the way we term it is we call it a dividend target. Um, yeah, again, if you guarantee it, it, it looks more like debt, and then it it's, it'll be more like interest. But with preferred stock, the benefit to the company is that it's equity, and if in, in a bad year you're not able to pay that dividend, you don't have to. I don't think there's limitations on the dividends that you can choose. Um, and then private offerings or public offerings, there's lots of uh, points along that spectrum. Uh, we did a, a Regulation D private offering where we were able to have 35 non-accredited investors and I think uh, uh, almost an unlimited amount of accredited investors, but that was that was more than enough for us to raise the kind of money we were, we were looking for, $750,000. And this next private offering, we might raise as much as $4 million, but you can do a Reg, a reg D private offering so that you don't have to do all the regulatory uh, hurdles that you have to do to do a public offering and it, it provides all the flexibility that, that we need but if someone wants to contact me offline I'd, I'd be happy to answer other questions if people have them. And I do have a participant on the webinar suggest uh, Margaret Bao who's suggesting that the uh, IRS subchapter T regulation around this is 8% so we're going to track this all down and I'll, uh, Margaret we'll talk to you offline as well. And um, when we send out the results from the webinar, we can also uh, include a footnote on this very technical question. I do want to move to another question, um, and this is a question from Stephanie Geller. Hi, Stephanie. Um, looking uh, to find out about how um, how Business Ownership Solutions funds its work. Um, I think you know, for folks interested in supporting conversions, it's important to know how uh, you know how to how to facilitate this kind of work uh, when you don't have a local infrastructure. So Rob, if you wanted to give us some answers on that, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, so quickly, it's uh, it's a mix of philanthropy and fee for service. Uh, you know, you, the the we did not charge anything that whole year long. Uh, getting to the closing table 
process. Uh, so philanthropy has to fill that gap. Uh, we attach a fee at closing, uh, just as lots of people, uh, interests, attach a fee at a closing of a, of a transaction. Uh, and now we have a, a fairly substantial technical assistance contract. I, I spend anywhere from a third to sometimes <laughs> half of my work week uh, just on them. Uh, and so I have a contract that the business uh, pays for that, and it's required by the lenders. So uh, it's I, and I can talk more about that with with anyone who's interested. But that's the general uh, structure of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, there's another really excellent question here, and I think it's another one for people who are really excited about uh, helping co-ops convert uh, and have some resources to do that. Um, and this is from Hendrix Berry, who asks, "What are strategies to find businesses who want to convert?" Uh, are there regions that are more co-op friendly? Are there specific industries to look into? Allison, do you have some thoughts I can on that? that one. This is Allison. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Great. So, um, so in Oakland, we did a study last year to to look at um, actually look at that question specifically through the lens of the low wage workforce. And so, so what we did was we pulled out down, we did a, a case study of Oakland and we pulled down all of the businesses in Oakland and we uh, put a couple of filters on that list. One was, is it in a, a growing or at least a not uh, declining industry? Is it, does it have a large portion of its workforce that are low wage workers? Um, and then what's the size of the business? So we put a threshold of 20 to 200 workers so we would have a good starting size. We believe you could probably do larger than that but we wanted to start on the smaller end. And so we actually now have a list of potential target businesses in Oakland. That analysis could be completed in any geography. Um, and then we looked at where the cluster of industries were. So not surprising, they were you know, in manufacturing and healthcare services. Commercial printing was actually a surprise for us. And logistics and shipping is a big deal in, in Oakland because we have the port here, among other uh, logistics uh, programs. And then the, the, other, the other ideal um, Data point would be age of business owner, and there are some databases that have um, have that field in it, but it's um, it's fairly unreliable. Um, but it does exist, uh, and it, it, they can be quite expensive actually to purchase. So that's the that's the approach that we've taken. And then from here, it's just it's all about the outreach. So how do you reach those businesses? Now that we have industry targets, we know the industry relationships to build, working through business networks locally, working through advisors. Uh, business owners are more likely to turn to their advisors, whether it's legal, CPA, or others. So making sure that those folks know that, that it, uh, from a succession planning perspective, selling to your owners is an opportunity. Yep. And there's a suggestion um, from a participant, Larry Gordon, who also suggests that local credit unions um, might have done analysis of the members who own businesses and might be considering suggestion uh, succession. So another helpful suggestion. There's one other question on here. Um, and we have uh, a small amount of time left. So, and it's a huge question. It's from Jim Seymour. It's about, uh, you know, what are the kinds of governance structures you need for worker cooperatives, and how do you make those decisions? Um, it's a much larger question. I think we can answer here. But I was wondering, as a way to wrap up, if just presenters could just talk, uh, just very quickly, throw out, you know, some of the most useful resources they know of for supporting this work. And understanding cooperatives and worker cooperatives. I, I'll, I'll go. I, I think Democracy at Work Institute is putting together some incredible materials uh, and definitely consult with them. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone anywhere about my experience and some tools that I've developed and that I've found uh, and sort of tailored to my own use. Uh, and also the ICA model bylaws, uh, uh, um, the ICA group, I would get in touch with the ICA group and look at the tools that they have developed uh, and, and, and read this report that Allison wrote. I mean, this is, this is the starting place. Yeah, and I would, I would second um, Democracy at Work Institute as a great resource in terms of for answering questions like governance structures. Um, another great resource is uh, Worker Co-ops Pathways to Scale, written by my co-founder, Hilary Abel, which is kind of more about, uh, from a field perspective, what are the opportunities. But it does, it does address, it does touch on some of the governance questions. Great. Well, John, we are at time here, so... Um... 
I guess we should wrap up. I want to thank all of our panelists and Allison for organizing this, and uh, thank of all all of our attendees. So thank you. It's been a great been a great session. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone. And we'll be sending out the presentations and the video uh, as soon as this is done. Okay. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. We good? I think we're good. Okay. Thanks, Thanks you guys. Everybody.